to Loyola University Chicago. This is our Water Tower campus, one of our three campuses in Chicago, and it's such a beautiful space to be hosting this conference today. My name is Mark Bosco. Uh, I'm a professor in the departments of English and in theology, and I run the Joan and Bill Hanks Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. This center is a uh, basically a research center and a place and a space to offer symposiums and conferences like this that kind of touch upon the Catholic intellectual and artistic heritage uh, to see if we can bring scholars together, students, faculty. So it's a real great pleasure to be sponsoring this uh, conference today, and thank you for coming. Um, I had to, first of all, thank also Melissa Bradshaw, who is our director of this conference. I just want to say a few words that, you know, really all the hard work that she put in and all of the conversations she had with you. So Ms., uh, we're very, Missy, as she's known to many of us, we're very, very pleased that Missy could help us put this all together. So thank you, Missy. <laughs> I first got to know uh, Denise Levertov's poetry uh, in the 1990s when I was studying at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, and, uh, and got it even more so when I uh, started working with Albert Jelpy at Stanford. Um, when I got to Loyola uh, in Chicago, uh, another colleague and I decided that we were going to do a course called Aesthetics and Ethics. And we were deciding, we, we, we were trying, what, it was, it's kind of uh, small to it. What comes first? Does aesthetics and beauty lead to the good? Or does the moral and the ethical kind of become the place for beauty? And so it was this wonderful kind of course with graduate students. One of the texts we used, though, was uh, the one that uh, Al and his colleague did on the letters of Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov. And it was a really a great experience to walk through or to read through those letters with students who were both in theology and in literature to talk about this kind of connection. I bring that up because that's where I truly fell in love with Denise Levertov, because in some ways she gives us the language to articulate how these things are really integrated, that art and ethics, that agency in the world, beauty, they're all in many ways a piece that kind of grounds our experience of being human. It's my pleasure to then uh, invite, invite everyone to these two days to talk about that relationship between uh, beauty poetry, the art of, the, of, of, of fiction, the, excuse me, the art of poetry, the art of poetic vision, in, in light of our world today, and the kind of poetry that uh, Denise Levertov uh, gives us. Um, I, I will go right to our first, uh, uh, our first plenary today, then, because we're a little bit behind, but that's okay. Um, and let me, I want to introduce Kevin Burke to you. Kevin and I go back about uh, 25 years uh, when I entered the Jesuits. And Kevin, Kevin was a few years ahead of me. And I, my first introduction with Kevin with a guitar, uh, with long hair and a beard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so I've known Kevin for quite a while. And uh, the, the, really the, the inspiration for this conference was uh, uh, Kevin was out here giving a talk on uh, Ignacio Ayacoria uh, about three years ago. And he is using Denise Levertov to structure his, his, his speech, or his talk, his presentation. And uh, it was really an exciting talk. Um, and I, he remembers me saying to him, we really should do a conference on Denise Levertov. I remember him saying to me, we really should do a, conversation, uh, do a conference on Levertov. So in some ways, uh, we thank Kevin for, for putting this together as well. Um, Kevin is a, a professor uh, former dean and now professor at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara in Berkeley, uh, California. Uh, has done a, quite a, a, a number of, uh, of monographs. His, his most recent work is A Grammar of Justice, The Legacy of Ignacio Ayacaria in 2014. Uh, he's currently on, at work on a theological interpretation of the poetry and life of Levertov. His talk is entitled, Still There and Always There, The Drama of Faith in the Life of Denise Levertov. Please help me welcome Kevin to the podium. I want to begin, though, with a word of thanks, first of all, to, uh, to Mark and to Missy and to all of those who organized this conference, to the Hanks Center here at Loyola University, and really to all of you. I mean, it's, uh, I have to say, I'm really humbled and I'm really honored to be here with you, and I've been really excited. I got on the plane uh, to come here yesterday, and I found I felt like I haven't looked forward to something like this. Uh, I don't know how long. It's especially gratifying to be here with so many of Denise's former students, with close friends, with noteworthy poets and poetry critics, 
with the editors of her collected poems, with the authors of two beautiful, important, and different biographies of uh, Denise Levertov. So great to be with you. And since the conference is on Denise Levertov, don't you think it makes sense to begin with an epigraph? <laughs> because so many times she'll let us know where she's coming from with an epigraph. So this is one that occurred to me. These words come from William Lynch, who is a great uh, philosopher, theologian, critic. Let theology, among the many things that it is, become a set of images of faith and a life of the imagination. And let the poet, always the imager, become also the thinker without limit. William Lynch is, uh, is a great thinker about the imagination and about how we enter into the human valley to find there the deeper realities. So the connection between Levertov and Lynch has been a useful one for my own thinking about why it is that Denise's poetry moves me so much. Reading her has changed me as a theologian. Uh, she's made me very attentive to the images of faith and the life of the imagination. As I engage, whether it's as a teacher, whether it's a, in my preaching, even in my own personal prayer, perhaps especially there, the poet has so much, so much to give to the theologian. And I hope the theologian can offer something in return. And that's what I'd like to do with, uh, with these uh, remarks this morning. So during our days together, along with a lot of analyzing, theorizing, etc., I suspect we'll find ourselves most thoroughly nourished when we experience or re-experience Denise's poetry, when we remember the breadth and the depth of her vision, and when we imagine with her the reality of our world, its dangers, its promises, its hopes. In the process of experiencing, remembering, imagining, this conference invites us to pick up on something extraordinary. Uh, this was a, uh, the title, uh, the phrase here is the title of an essay on Denise Levertov's continuing importance, published last year in America Magazine by Ed Block Jr., who's with us this morning. So Ed's question in this essay, what is Denise's enduring worth, is in a sense our question at this conference. If, as he suggests, on us depends the future, the fortune of her words, her reputation, then in our gathering together as poets, biographers, literary critics, theologians, spiritual writers, people who delved into the poetry she produced, we might venture a small step in the direction of extending and deepening her reputation, which of course is not something she needs. <laughs> it's, it's we who are nourished by her words and her witness. It's we who need her to be known. We and our children and our grandchildren are the beneficiaries of the appreciation we help to nourish. I'll speak about the title of the conference in a moment. I picked this particular image off the uh, Loyola uh, University website for the conference. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the, the actual title this need to dance, this need to kneel. But first, let me talk about this in interplay between poetry and a poetic life. The interaction of life on art and of art on life is continuous, writes Denise in uh, Notes on Organic Forum. Poetry is necessary to a whole person. And that poetry be not divided from the rest of life is necessary to it. Both life and poetry fade, wilt, shrink if they are divorced. This common correlation appears with uncommon density and richness in Levertov's own case, a point that numerous scholars, including Dana Green and Donna Krolik Hollenberg, her biographers, they've made when assessing her achievements. So but beneath matters of reputation lie questions about the truth of Levertov's life and the truth that her life unveils. Like the correlation between an artist's life and work, these two concerns are interrelated. And each represents a point of departure and a fruitful field for investigation. And others may focus here on the former. I choose to frame my investigations with particular attention to the latter, the truth 
that Denise Levertov's life unveils. Might she be one of those remarkable human beings who reveals something essential about our human situation, our deepest crises, our most extravagant hopes? I raise this multivalent question as a theologian with a special interest in the nature of the language we use to do theology. Above all, I have an interest in correlating those spiritual bellwethers whose self-implicating witness informs the theological discourse. So I can restate my question in more explicitly theological key. Might Denise Levertov be among the most important contemporary pioneers of the human spirit, of the human spiritual quest, at least here in the US context? Might her life provide a special lens for probing the meaning of Christian faith? Might her poetry serve as a source or a resource for contemporary theology? And might we discover in the drama of her life of faith someone uniquely capable of illuminating for our day the deep dialectics of faith and doubt? I think, and you may think with me, that it might sound strange to suggest that Denise Levertov's entire life exemplifies a faith journey especially in the light of many years she lived as an agnostic, her word, and even more given some of the moral choices she made, some of the attitudes she exhibited, she herself might call this into question. I can imagine certain people, I can imagine certain religious people, who would be scandalized by my suggestion that she reveals something elemental about the drama of faith, and that this in turn allows her to serve as an exemplar of the struggle for authentic faith in our age. But I do not think this is actually that strange or scandalous, although I would use the word ironic in the very specific sense that William Lynch uses that word with respect to Christ. Human and divine, low and high. The first will be last. The grain that dies gives life. This is irony as the mentor of faith. It is in this sense of an incarnational human irony, an irony that takes us into the drama of doubt, where a clearer sense of the meaning of faith emerges that Denise Levertov serves as an exemplary guide. So my thoughts here are in four movements. I call the first a snapshot from a life in time. I trust that all of us who are gathered here are familiar at least with the broad outlines of Denise Levertov's life. You can find a lot of five page, eight page, 10 page uh, summaries of her life online. Lots of different people have taken. And of course, we've got these two great biographies. So there's a lot more that can be said and a lot that doesn't need to be re-rehearsed. But it is interesting to notice that oftentimes people go back to her childhood, go back to this remarkable family and an unusual way of being educated. Um, so I want to talk about her parents and her sister, her troubled but beloved sister, Olga. So, but begin with her mother. So, Benice, Lever Benice Spooner Jones Levertov, who was, of course, born in Wales. In her poem, The 90th Year, Denise tells us, it was she who taught me to look, to name the flowers when I was still close to the ground, my face level with theirs or to watch the sublime metamorphoses unfold and unfold over the walled back gardens of our street. How tears of pleasure would choke her when a perfect voice, high or deep, clove to its note, unfaltering. Beatrice met her future husband, Denise's father, when she was teaching English in a Scottish mission school in Constantinople. Paul Philip Levertov. Yes, he came from Byzant He came to Byzantium from Russia. Of him, Denise writes, as a devout Christian, my father took delight and pride in being like Christ and the apostles, a Jew. It was Hasidic lore, his heritage. He drew on to know the Holy Spirit as Shekinah. Denise's sister Olga, nine years older than she a brilliant woman whose life was difficult, even tortured. In her book of Lamentations entitled The Sorrow Dance, 
and then later in her strident volume of anti-war poems, To Stay Alive, Denise included the heartrending elegy that she wrote for El Olga, beginning with these lines. By the gas fire, kneeling to undress, scorching luxuriantly, raking her nails over all of sides, the red waistband ring, 16, her breasts round, round, and dark nippled, who now these two months long is bones and tatters of flesh in earth. And of course, the youngest daughter, Denise, herself described later as an air plant, a person not so much deeply rooted in one place, but who took root everywhere, who grew up to inhabit the spaces between worlds, who says of herself, among Jews, a goy, among Gentiles, secular or Christian, a Jew, or at least a half Jew, among Anglo-Saxons, a Celt, and Wales, a Londoner, who not only did not speak Welsh, but was not imbued with Welsh attitudes. And all of these anomalies predicted my later experience. I so often feel English, or perhaps European, in the United States, while in England, I sometimes feel American. But these feelings of not belonging were positive for me, not negative. I was given such a sense of confidence by my family, in my family, that though I was often shy and have remained so in certain respects, I nevertheless experienced the sense of a difference as an honor, as part of knowing secretly from an early age, perhaps by seven, certainly before I was 10, I was an artist person and had a destiny. <laughs> I love that phrase. So here we see the artist person who had a destiny with her whole family and some of the altar service servers at her father's Anglican parish. Denise's career as a poet, already launched in London shortly after the Second World War, began to take off a year after she and her husband, Mitchell Goodman, moved to the United States in the late 1940s. Although it was almost a 10-year gap between her first book of poetry and her second, her literary career can be interpreted in lots of different ways. I've put together a timeline that is kind of really simplified. It's not perfect because there's some, uh, there's some overlap between these things. But I want to think about three phases. An early phase that includes the double image, but then includes those five volumes that were published between 56 and 64, the years of her close association with Duncan and with William Carlos Williams. And then a middle phase that begins with the Sorrow Dance, which really is a kind of a, a transitional volume, but you really begin to get the notes about the Vietnam War, the sense of impending gloom, the awareness of the political. And I, I take this up to Life in the Forest, and of course the next transitional volumes would be Candles in Babylon. And I see the later phases beginning there and moving through oblique prayers and finally to her posthumous collected uh, this great unknowing. So here I put them all together so you can just kind of see for a moment this periodization. There's nothing magical about this. There's probably better ways to do this, but it has the nice simplicity of giving us 45 to 65, 65 to 80, 80 to the end of her life. And in a sense, you can think of this as there was a focus on the personal, on, on one's own life, one's own experience, a growing intention to the political, to the public concerns, and a deepening awareness of the mystical and the spiritual. Although I think it's fair to say, and I think you would agree with me, all of those concerns are present all through her life. And it's actually the unity of her life that I'm most interested in thinking about with you. So my thesis is that a river runs through the whole of her being, and its banks touch all the phases and stages she went through. There's a deep unity in her spiritual quest, but nevertheless, recurring themes appear in all the phases you can detect particular attention to these various phases. And so let's take a look at some of the poetry as we move into a second movement. I call this, Don't Say There Is No Water. So what is this face that suffuses her whole corpus of her poetry? I want to begin my exploration of this question with an image from one of the poems of her early phase. It's entitled The Fountain. 
and was published in this beautiful collection called The Jacob's Ladder. Venice writes, don't say, don't say there is no water to solace the dryness at our hearts. I have seen the fountain springing out of the rock wall and you drinking there. That's the beginning. The ending of this poem echoes these opening lines, but it takes the image to a deeper level. <coughs> don't say, don't say there is no water. That fountain is there among its scalloped green and gray stones. It is there, still there, and always there with its quiet song and strange power to spring in us up and out through the rock. Such striking biblical images, especially from the, the Hebrew Bible. And it's this image of still there and always there that gives the sense of continuity that I want to underscore throughout all my remarks. This something springs in us the fountain, or what in many other places she captures with the image of the well, beautifully explored in a dissertation by a woman named Louise Mills, writing in Melbourne in Australia. She talks about how throughout Denise's life, the image of the well recurs. The human as a source of life, with a life-giving something within us, a source of music, of mystery, all that is evoked by the image of the nascent spring, the rill, the brook, it is there among its scalloped green and gray stones. That is, it is here in the landscape of ordinary living, in the aspect of our reality that we don't always notice. But whether we notice it or not, it is still there and always there <coughs> with its quiet song and strange power. This source of mystery this inclination to breathe into the silence and the darkness of faith is always there, was always there in the case of Denise Levertov. So not denying or minimizing her long swim in the waters of agnosticism, as I briefly noted above, and I'm not gainsaying the fact that as she began to swim in the new waters of explicit Christian faith at the beginning of what I call her late phase, that she and many of her commentators refer to this using the traditional language of conversion, I actually want to always put quotation marks around that word because it's not really a turning around in the usual sense. In her case, it's a going deeper. And in a very powerful way in Denise's life, the, con the conversion or the awakening to explicit practice of Christian faith did not mean leaving behind the deep Jewish roots of her life that she inherited from her father, or her interest in Eastern religions and other ways of exploring reality. In Denise, there was always a deep sense of all of it is contained, and it doesn't necessarily mean the exclusion of one or the other. And so there is a recurring uh, there's a shift in her explicit loyalties. I mean, she begins going to church again. You know, she begins haunting the various parishes and things. She eventually becomes a Catholic towards the end of her life. But all of that occurs within the lifelong struggle. For example, the image of Jacob wrestling with an angel, one of her favorite images, it one that comes up over and over in her poetry. Where is the angel to wrestle with me? and to wound, not my thigh, but my throat, so blessings and curses flow storming out. And this marvelous statue from the Tate Museum, I have a photograph of the men who are moving it, they come up to about the knees. This is a very large statue of wrestling, and Jacob is exhausted at the end of the night. As Dana Green points out, the same continuity appears in the crucial image of another poem from the Jacob's Ladder, The Thread. Denise writes, something is very gently, invisibly, silently pulling at me. A thread, or net of threads, finer than cobweb and as elastic. 
She recognized that something that pulled at her very early on. And throughout the course of her life, she appears to use a range of images to get at this something, often drawing on language that appears to be more literary or mythological or even secular than what we normally call religious. Because, of course, we forget that all of our religious language is, first of all, secular. But nevertheless, this something that she identifies as a thread is integral to her very self, something to be valued, something to be cherished. She doesn't resent it. She doesn't see it as a threat. Rather, as she avers at the conclusion of the thread, not fear, but a string of wonder makes me catch my breath when I feel the tug of it, when I thought it had loosened itself and gone. This thread might have something to do with what I mean when I speak of the faith journey of Denise Leverton. But in order to illustrate this, allow me to pause for a moment and reflect just for a minute with you on this word faith. Because in contemporary US public discourse, one often sees faith as an adherence to a particular set of beliefs, usually vehemently held. <laughs> and we conflate faith with a set of beliefs, of dogmas, that cannot be established on the basis of philosophical or scientific reason, but only accepted on the basis of some authority. I grew up in Wyoming. I used to see this bumper sticker. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. <laughs> And I often thought, I'm really glad I didn't grow up in that pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> to make things even more complicated, we see faith as utterly private, as having no force in the public sphere. These are images of faith that I would call deeply problematic, or at least deeply incomplete. There may be grains of truth in them, but they can function like ideology with a species of fanatical fervor. One way of esteeming Denise's enormous achievement as a poet and as a person derives from the way she finds and forges vital, penetrating images of faith to replace the reified, desiccated, and polarizing images that bedevil our culture's decadent religious discourse. Like Lynch, she, who Lynch argues forcefully for our need to reimagine faith, Levertov seeks to reconstruct the alphabet, to relearn the world, understood anew, only in doing. Bench urges us to construct an image of faith as a great primal and primitive force that precedes or even constructs knowledge itself. And he likewise observes as a second crucial aspect of faith, it has a his horizontal as well as a vertical line. It's not just about transcendence, it's about the world. It has a body, indeed many bodies. And because faith is embodied, it is imaginable. So without explicitly saying so, when Denise writes, for example, in this marvelous poem, Beginners, we have only begun to love the earth, only begun to imagine the fullness of life. She is witnessing to the crucial importance of the body of faith, the human city, of a new way of imagining human community and its relationship to the earth. She is imagining a new way of living in the body, and in so doing, she's building up what Lynch calls the body of faith. And so I come to the heart of this exploration, this need to dance, this need to kneel, a third <coughs> movement, which I want to focus on the poem that our conference title has picked up on. If I'm near the mark at all with my suggestion regarding the, levator, the revelatory meaning of Denise Levertov's life, then the main title of our conference takes on particular significance. The evocative doublet this need to need dance, this need to kneel, that ruffles the waters of everyday experience, includes the inner experience of our own inchoate impulses, gestures, and choices. First published in Oblique Prayers, On Being, the 
poem from which these lines were taken was written toward the beginning of her late period, which among other things is marked by her return to the explicit practice of religious faith. This poem, and in particular the lines that make up our title, point to that something that Denise had already begun to name decades before in the thread and the fountain sense of the more, the fullness of life. Here is the poem on being in its entirety. I know this happiness is provisional, the looming presences, great suffering, great fear, withdraw only into peripheral vision. But Ineluctable, this shimmering of wind in the blue leaves, this flood of stillness widening the lake of sky, this need to dance, this need to kneel, this mystery. Thirteen-line poem with two commas, two dashes, six colons, and no periods. <laughs> this is someone who paid a lot of attention to uh, punctuation, right? It's one of the things that makes her so readable. This entire meditation is indeed provisional, expectant. The very grammatical form of the poem is open. It seems to drive language to the outermost boundaries where it can breathe, survive, and point to the more that lies beyond it. Precisely in this anticipatory provisionality, Denise touches something essential regarding spirituality, the religious, the very meaning and content of such words as faith and doubt. I say precisely because in contrast to the immature faith appropriate to infants and children, which is strong in the sense of being absolute, unambiguous, unyielding, and unironic, the strength of mature faith is tense and flexible, open to nuance and, new and newness, flooded with paradox. Mature faith admits doubts. It grows through the ministrations of a loving irony whose rhythm, act, suffer, learn. William Lynch traces back to the dramas of Aeschylus. Here in this poignant sigh of a poem, Denise sets out from an experience not yet named or captured, an experience that is open-ended yet unavoidable, an experience that leads to thought rather than flowing from previous thoughts, definitions, or formulae. It is the inscape of the human impulse, this need to dance, this need to kneel, that appears almost as a hologram of the inscape of all reality, this mystery. The genius of her faith buds from her profound attention and appreciation of this connection. But note, for all of the spiritual beauty of this poem, What's striking is its insistence on the earth, on the concrete, material reality of the world, the shimmering of wind in the blue leaves, the flood of stillness widening the lake of sky, the human need to dance and the act of dancing, the need to kneel and the reverent gesture of kneeling. Neither the poem nor the truest of our religious impulses allow faith to deny matter or the earth, or the body, much less our discontents or our disappointments. And so the looming presences, great suffering, great fear, are present here within the experience of faith. The irony of faith does not reject suffering or ridicule fear. It does not shy away from doubt, nor does it aim to transcend life's troubles, but rather to enter them. Faith is not an escape. It's an entrance into life, true faith. Far from a denial of death and its analogs, the need to dance, the need to kneel, emerge from the heart of mature human living 
that ironically encounters and encompasses suffering. These are the characteristic gestures of human depth. The spiritual and the earthly are utterly and completely connected, which gives dramatic weight to the enigmatic adjective at the heart of the poem, ineluctable. It's interesting, isn't it, that she would select an adjective to hang the whole poem on? That sounds like bad writing to me. And such an unusual adjective, one we can hardly pronounce. But no way the word is placed. She's already passed the first two colons. In fact, the fact of her unexpected and provisional happiness and the fact of great suffering and great fear are indeed looming presences in and throughout life. But the shimmering of the wind, the flood of silence, the correlative felt need to celebrate and to worship remain unavoidable, inescapable, inexorable standard synonyms for ineluctable, which nevertheless fail to capture a key connotation detected in her adjective and verified in its etymology, the element of struggle. The Latin word electare means to struggle. And to overcome, the over, that overtone remains in such cognates as reluctant, Right? which suggests being unwilling to struggle against, and ineluctable, which literally would mean not to be avoided by struggling. What is not to be avoided? It's not fear. It's not the unknown. What is not to be avoided is the shimmering of wind in the blue leaves, the flood of stillness widening the lake of sky, the need to dance, the need to kneel, this mystery, what is not to be avoided, is the reality of our hoping that points without our seeing to our hope. What is not to be avoided? It is in the reality of our lives that we encounter a spirit-filled joy, as the evangelist Luke so distinctly expresses it. It's in the fact of our happiness, however provisional, that gives rise to the inescapable sense of the more, present in all that we touch. But among the great lessons that Denise teaches regarding faith, that it involves struggle, that it requires that we enter fully into the valley of the human, another Lynch, Lynch's images, and in this lesson that comes to light when we attend to the further important irony in this poem, notice, Although Levertov clearly seems to draw on the fruits of spiritual experience in writing this poem, and although it clearly evokes the religious and the theological, the title of the poem, On Being, resonates overtly with the history of Western philosophy. It calls to mind a key word in the vocabulary of some of our greatest philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, for example and in works being written during her own lifetime, Heidegger's being in time, Sartre's being in nothingness. It's significant that the poem's title points to philosophy because philosophy begins with the reality of this world, and that's the point. Levertov's acute phenomenological observations from the brink of her colons, if you don't mind me saying so, cannot be dismissed as something beyond public discourse. The experience of the more is not restricted to some group of spiritual insiders, some esoteric cult. The experience of the more is something anyone can verify in her or his own experience. This need to dance, this need to kneel. And although on being is not intended as a philosophical or transcendental meditation per se, it does lodge within the ambit of reason, of philosophical reason, an act of witness, an act of faith, one that she intrinsically reconnects with the essential biblical witness. And so let me end with that explicit connection. I call this last movement the key now to the next door.
It connects, of course, to freedom and to discernment. This fourth and final movement, recall the words of William Lynch with which I began. That poetry, among the many things that it is, become a set of images of faith and a life of the imagination. And let the poet, always the imager, become the thinker without limit. What the poet gives to the theologian is what keeps theology alive. Images of faith drawn from the bones of the earth. If the theologian can help the poet realize that what she was doing all along, even when she seemed furthest from faith, was part of a faith journey, the poet makes a return gift and enables the theologian to once again attend to faith, not as something captured by the philosophical system, but something ineluctable, living, alive, and abroad in the world. Part of our job job of the theologian, however haltingly, however incompletely, is to attempt to give voice to our experiences of wonder beyond emptiness, of joy beyond and even within the most searing suffering. And who better to turn to than the poets? In an age in which religion receives such an ambiguous reception and faith itself is such a contested term, what is still there and always there the poetic gesture. So I take this final title, the key now to the next door, from the penultimate line in Denise's late poem, St. Peter and the Angel. The story of the poem that the poem retells comes from the beginning of chapter 12 of St. Luke's Acts of the Apostles. The biblical narrative set in the period after the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit to Jesus' followers recalls the danger inherent in their mission of announcing the gospel. Annunciation necessarily implies denunciation of the death of Jesus and of the religious status quo. And it led to the violent persecution of the Christian community and its leaders by Herod. As the story opens, St. Luke tells us King Herod laid hands on some of the members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by the sword. And when he saw this was pleasing to some of the leaders of the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also, arrest Peter also. And he had him taken into custody and put in prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. A little bit of overkill, right? Uh, seems like military people are always interested in overkill. Luke continues the narrative by telling us that Peter was secured by double chains and sleeping between two soldiers with more guards outside the cell. And suddenly, God's angel appears, stands by Peter, awakens him, taps him on the shoulder, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists, and he left the prison following the angel past the cohort of sleeping guards, not realizing Luke tells us that what was happening through the angel was real. I love that sentence. He thought he was seeing a vision. He was seeing reality. Here's Denise's retelling in a poem version this story, St. Peter and the Angel. Delivered out of raw, continual pain, smell of darkness, groans of those others to whom he was chained, unchained and led past the sleepers, door after door, silently opening out. And along, along streets, majestic emptiness under the moon, one hand on the angel's shoulder, one feeling the air before him, eyes open but fixed. And not till he saw the angel had left him, alone and free to resume the ecstatic, dangerous, wearisome roads of what he had still to do, not till then did he realize this was no dream, 
more frightening than arrest than being chained to his warders. He could hear his own footsteps suddenly. Had the angel's feet made any sound? He could not recall. No one had missed him. No one was in pursuit. He himself must be the key now to the next door, the next terrors of freedom and joy. New Testament scholars like to point out the profound symmetry between this and similar jailbreak narratives in the Acts of the Apostles and the empty tomb narratives in the Gospels of Luke and the other synoptics. The earliest accounts hint to the resurrection of Jesus. The angelic jailbreak is a type of resurrection story. Luke deliberately recreates a parallel between the empty tomb and the empty prison cell that emphasizes the concreteness of God's saving action. However, the particular resurrection story is not so much a resurrection from death, per se, but a liberation or rescue from the living death of a hopeless situation, of a hopelessness, of a sightlessness. The gospel writer does not want us to fixate on the quote-unquote miraculous aspect of the story. That's never the point of the gospels. Rather, in answer to the question, what can we know? We can affirm that we know counterintuitively death does not defeat life. And the tyrant will not triumph over God's history. What can we know directly? We can know the world and know it precisely as God's world. The resurrection doesn't take us out of the world. It puts us in the world. It is, as it were, the flip side of the grace of incarnation. Levertov gets at all this in a remarkable way. More frightening than arrest, than being chained, is our freedom and our call. The night is frightening, but in an interesting way, the dawn is more frightening. I have a friend who talks about Kung Fu Jesus. This is the Jesus of the resurrection. It's his Easter homily. He says, Kung Fu Jesus knocks down that comfortable little room, that upper room where the disciples are, and guess what? It's never there again. From then on, they're out on the roads. It's not Kung Fu Panda, it's Kung Fu Jesus. What we have to do now, what Peter has to do, Levertov tells us, he himself must be the key now to the next door. The point is this. Resurrection is a call. It's a vocation story. The resurrection narratives in the New Testament are not miracle stories. They were never intended by the gospel writers as miracle stories. They're call narratives. Their antecedents are the call of Moses at the burning bush the call of the prophets of Jeremiah, of Isaiah. That's the kind of narrative. The call of Mary in the Annunciation story. The resurrection stories are vocation stories. And the point is this. Vocation emerges precisely out of the ineluctable joy, the irrepressible hope that accompanies the realization he is not here, he has been raised. The resurrection narratives all have this structure and logic. The person who experiences Jesus alive and exalted experiences also a call to hear that good news to others. The good news that in this inhuman world, it is still possible to be a human being. The good news that despite the looming presences, great suffering, great fear, Ineluctable. The need to dance. This need to kneel. This is true. Thank you.
uh, for our conference. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Uh, there's a ton of time for any comments or questions. A few minutes, if anybody would have anything to say, uh, Kevin has agreed to. Uh, to you know, they often say questions. What I really think is sometimes you might have your own spontaneous thoughts or images and our comments. So I'm no expert here, but I would love to, any thoughts you have. It was just an association, the word ineluctable, in Joyce, ineluctable modality of the invisible. I don't know if she... Very I possible she would have read no it. Idea, but it just struck me for the first time. That's a, thank you for that. I, wasn't, I never made that connection. I wouldn't be surprised if she read Joyce, yeah. because a lot of people her generation did, and she was a great reader. Thank you for that. What is it again? The ineluctable? The ineluctable modality of the invisible. The ineluctable modality it's in, uh, of the invisible. It's coming from Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah, but really, yeah. 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 It's um, in Portrait of the Artist. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Al? I was just saying very ineluctable, very joyce in word. But you know when you, you when you were uh, talking about the importance of the image of the of the fountain and of the well and in Levitard's work, it, 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 it made me flash back to uh, a, a time in 1967 in Cambridge uh, when Mitch Goodman, Denise's husband, was on trial with Dr. Spock. And the, and it was in the in the deeps of, of her political activity and uh, uh, and protesting, and she was just so busy with Mitch's trial and was traveling all around that she was worried, as Duncan kept telling her, you know, that she was losing her poetic gifts. And she and Mitch came over after the trial to our our apartment and, and had a and had a drink and to, to relax, and we were. We were then doing the I Ching. We were Barbara and I were both, or, or, or both doing the I Ching, and we said to Mitch and Denise, "You, you want to do? You want to? You want to do it?" We're, we're facing a lot of momentous uh, times now, and so Denise asked. <coughs> Denise said, "I feel so dry now. I'm having a dry period, and I'm very worried about it." And she threw the the stick for the I Ching, and the image she got was of the well. Um, and, and the commentary said, the well is always there. Sometimes it runs dry, but the well is always there. And she took great, great comfort in it. No, it's interesting, Al, and I, I'm not going to be able to quote the lines from memory, but in the notebook poem from To Stay Alive, yeah. there's a really crucial passage where she talks about the well. Yeah. Where in almost exactly, yeah. it's like the image could have come from her evening at your house. Well, and that poem comes from the same years. From those but years, yeah. Same, very Intense, yeah. 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 Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. Back behind her. Ed? Another residence that I, that I caught when you, you quoted the uh, uh, St. Peter and the Angel, uh, his hand on the angel's shoulder, it's, it's like some of her uh, blindness poems, where some, she is leading someone or someone's leading her. That's another thread that runs through. It's very gestural, too. If you talk about connecting with the body, so much of her poetry is full of this gestural fullness. Yeah, it's a, what's the poem, An Uncertain Ornaments? Yeah, from, and it's one of her late poems, right? Isn't that from uh, Sands of the Wells? So that's a, that's a great connection. The thoughts? A lot of work for one quick comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just commented to uh, Emily after that talk that uh, Denise would have been delighted. Really, really. Well, thank you. You know, uh, unlike many of you, I never actually met her. Uh, although I was probably living a mile from her. In the years that I was first ordained a priest, I was living at St. Anne's Parish in Somerville. 
just on the other side of town from Davis Square where she was living. I didn't know about her at that time. It was one of my friends in doctoral studies, a woman who now works uh, as a pastoral chaplain in St. Louis. She was the one who first really got me reading Denise's poems in the late 90s, just around the time Denise was nearing the end of her life. And it was about 2000 that I began to read her with the real intentionality. And so I've noticed this pattern in my life. The people that I've most loved and studied, Ignacio Acria, the Jesuit from El Salvador, Pedro Rupe, the Father General of the Jesuits, who Oscar Romero, the great Bishop of El Salvador, and now Denise Levertov. I met them after their deaths. And always there's this ironic sense that the more I get to know them, the more I miss them. And the missing is part of the knowing, as uh, uh, another good friend of mine likes to say. So thank you for that. Uh, that means a lot to me, because I've often thought uh, at times she, I, I, I have no idea. If, if we had met, if we would have hit it off, I know from my side we would have. <laughs>